Hey guys, today I'll show you a supernatural horror mystery TV series named 30 Coins Season 1. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins with an explanation on the origin of the 30 silver coins of Judas, one of Jesus' 12 disciples. It's said that at the Last Supper between Jesus and his disciples, Jesus had explained the meaning of the Holy Communion and made a covenant, declaring that the person who betrayed him is on the same table. This person refers to Judas. It turns out not long ago, Judas approached the Jewish priests who despised Jesus and asked how much they would give him if he revealed Jesus' whereabouts. The answer was 30 silver coins. Just like that, Judas betrayed Jesus for a cheap price. After the Last Supper, Jesus was arrested and ultimately crucified. At this point, Judas had a sudden realization. Unable to bear the sight of Jesus being crucified, he hanged himself on the outskirts of Jerusalem, and the 30 silver coins scattered on the ground, which paved the way to the story's development. Somewhere in Switzerland, an old man wearing a spherical necklace around his neck briskly walked into a bank. He drew a gun and started shooting everyone in sight. The security guards fired back with several shots hitting the old man. However, he seemed unaffected, reloading his weapon and continuing his rampage. It seems that his target was a single silver coin. After securing the coin, he retraced his steps, getting shot several times along the way but still moving as if unscathed. Finally, he climbed into a car where a man wearing sunglasses was waiting. As the man removed the necklace from the old man's neck, the old man finally died. The man in sunglasses took the coin from the old man's hand, specifically collecting it for some yet unknown reason. The scene then shifts to Pedraza in Segovia, Spain, where a cow was about to give birth. Many people from the town came to observe and learn, since assisting a cow in giving birth isn't something just anyone can do. Amid a storm, a gust of wind blew open the barn door. The vet, Elena, attempted to close it, but the wind was too strong. Eventually, she gave up and returned to the birthing process. To everyone's shock, the cow gave birth to a human baby boy, rather than a calf that it was supposed to be. The news spread quickly, causing a stir in the town. The mayor, Paco, rushed over, and upon closer inspection confirmed that the infant was indeed a human cowboy. He then decided to suppress the news and, along with a group of townsfolk, sought the town's only priest for help. The bald priest named Padre, with his hair attached to his good-looking face, was in the church working on his muscles and flexing his beard. Upon hearing the news of a cow giving birth to a child, he nearly laughed his smelly beard off. But then, after reviewing the surveillance footage on his phone, he noticed a blind spot when the barn door was blown open by the wind. There were a few seconds during which the calf could possibly have been replaced with a baby. So in the priest's opinion, the question wasn't why the cow gave birth to a human, but rather whose baby it was. Paco's wife, Merce, unable to bear the situation, reminded him that their slaughterhouse and restaurant were about to open, and he should be leveraging his status as mayor for that, instead of investigating a cow giving birth to a human baby. Paco was undeterred, stating that as the mayor it was his duty to help the townsfolk. Just then, the waitress revealed a bombshell that a schoolgirl named Trini hadn't been to school in a week and couldn't be contacted. Her belly had been slightly protruded before, leading to suspicions that she had secretly given birth to the child. Paco and Elena decided to investigate. The farm owner was Trini's father. Upon hearing that Trini might have been involved with a boy, he angrily tried to slap her. But Paco intervened, leading to a harsh scolding from her father. He also accused Elena of meddling, saying that her husband had only been missing for two years, but now she was already involved with the mayor. This resulted in a brawl between them. During the chaos, Trini's water broke. Her mother lifted her skirt to see that Trini was indeed pregnant. To hide her condition, she had tightly wrapped her abdomen in cloth. Paco and Elena rushed her to the hospital. Now, it seemed the child born from the cow was not Trini's. After a careful review of the video, the most likely culprit seemed to be a young beggar. He was always idle, always there when something was happening. At this moment, the beggar noticed Father Padre suspiciously transporting things into the church. Upon closer inspection, he found it was all weaponry. When Padre caught him, he threatened him to keep quiet. The beggar readily agreed and even suggested hiding the weapons at a secret place he knew and offered to lead him there. Afterward, Paco and the others found the beggar's home, a small homemade tent. It was full of Christian items. Even though the beggar couldn't read, there was a Bible. The police officer speculated that it was probably stolen from the church. Suddenly, the church bells rang. The townspeople came over, only to see the beggar was planning to throw the child born from the cow off a high building, shouting strange words about the devil coming. Padre went up and tried to persuade him to stop. The beggar listened and handed the child back to Elena. 
The beggar told Father Padre that he did all this for him, and only this way could Padre's sins be forgiven. With that, he jumped off the building, leaving a large dent in a car. Elena found a silver coin near the car and quickly hid it when she saw Padre approaching. That night, Paco investigated Father Padre and found his criminal past. He had been an exorcist and had caused someone's death, leading to a two-year prison sentence. However, Paco firmly believed that Padre was a good person. Later, Elena arrived at the church and showed Padre the silver coin she had found. Recognizing it, he revealed that it was from Giacomo, a boy he had exercised in the past. Back then, he had found the coin under the boy's skin, but he had no idea how it ended up here. He gave the coin to Elena, asking her to take it if she liked it. Later, an old lady from the farm came to thank Elena for the delivery because she had always wanted a child, but was unable to conceive. Miraculously, a child was born from a cow, which seemed like divine intervention. Elena, puzzled, remarked that she should be thanking God, not her. As they prepared to leave, the old lady's husband stopped Elena. He revealed that they had a child who had accidentally drowned in a pool. The incident had left a permanent trauma on his wife. But ever since the cow gave birth to a child, his wife seemed like a different person. Elena optimistically suggested this could help his wife forget her past. However, the husband firmly disagreed, stating it wasn't a blessing but a curse. He then proposed to show her the child, saying that it's a prodigy and it could even start walking in just a few days. Elena shared her suspicions with Paco. She suspected the child had acromegaly, or a disorder resulting in an overproduction of growth hormones. In short, it was all too abnormal. Paco, of course, didn't believe it. He drove Elena home, saying they should check on the child in the coming morning, rather than in the middle of the night. After dropping Elena off at her home, Paco stayed for a short while. He noticed a picture of Elena and her husband on a table. Her husband had disappeared two years ago, and there was still no sign of him. His disappearance was very mysterious. He had simply vanished. As Paco was leaving, he noticed someone outside and panicked. He wondered how it would look coming out of a widow's house in the middle of the night. Elena, furious, challenged him to stay or leave. With that, she stormed out in anger. Padre returned home and, while smoking, reflected on his past, particularly his unsuccessful exorcism of the boy Giacomo. He had tried everything, but nothing worked. He remembered noticing a protrusion on Giacomo's arm. Upon pressing it, a silver coin burst out, but Giacomo died immediately thereafter. When Elena found Padre, he said the problem now was not who the child belonged to, but who wanted the child. He handed her an envelope. Meanwhile, the old lady started feeding the child animal liver, claiming it was to supplement trace elements. Her husband, intending to leave, thinking his wife had gone mad and he needed to get help. However, his wife stabbed and killed him with a knitting needle. Later, Elena went to Paco's house and threw stones at his window to get his attention. She showed him the envelope from Padre. It contained an adoption agreement signed by the old lady and her husband, clearly indicating that the child had been given to them by someone. She asserted that it must be someone of ultimate evil. The two decided to sneak into the old lady's house that night to investigate. Upon entering, they found that the house had turned into a spider's den. The old lady had knitted a nest for the child with wool, and the husband's body was hanging there. The lady appeared, asking if they were also trying to take the child away from her. Then she lunged at Paco with a knife. Elena managed to escape for her life, leaving the old lady, who seemed to have been possessed, to wrap Paco up. She even claimed she was doing all this because someone in her head was instructing her to do so. Elena rushed to call the police and Padre. A few people entered, guns at the ready. The possessed old lady spotted Padre and said that he couldn't escape what's coming for him. She then asked Father Padre to return their silver coin. Hearing this, Padre understood that he and the coin were their targets. An altercation with the old lady ensued. Possessed by something evil, she was incredibly strong. Left with no choice, the police had to shoot her. Paco was injured and rushed to the hospital with his wife by his side. After that, Elena went back to the old lady's house to search for the child, unable to believe that the child had matured to be a grown-up bearded man. But upon close observation, she realized it's Father Padre sitting in a corner. Padre advised her to deny whatever she was about to see, and she would be safe if she didn't believe what she saw. Elena picked up something resembling a skin pouch from the ground, retorting how she was supposed to deny seeing this. Paco, in the ambulance, managed to utter a few words before fainting. The old lady, who was supposed to be dead, rose again, mumbling something while holding a homemade baby toy. Suddenly, a spider-like creature appeared on the road, causing the driver to swerve and the vehicle to overturn. This jolt woke Paco up. The creature opened the ambulance doors, and the old lady walked out happily, saying goodbye to the mayor and that her son had come to collect her. 
Meanwhile, Padre led Elena to a secret room in the church filled with guns and ammunition. He asked her to pick something she could handle. Suddenly, they heard a noise outside. The possessed old lady had followed them, pleading with Padre to return the coin or they would force her to kill. Then she slapped Padre, sending him flying like a toy. Elena quickly hid. At the same time, Paco tried to call Elena to warn her about the spider-like creature, but the doctor forcefully took his phone away. Suddenly, the old lady appeared, asking where the coin was. Elena took out the coin and asked her if she was referring to this. As she reached to grab it, Padre grabbed the lady's greasy body, throwing her against the wall like a bowling ball. He then performed a ritual on the bullets, imbuing them with the power to kill demons. Without hesitation, he shot the greasy lady. This time, she was surely dead as a piece of soap. Padre carried the lady's body away as Elena observed from the shadows. Suddenly, a terrifying face appeared before her, revealing that the human-like cowboy had transformed into a handsome eight-legged monster. Meanwhile, Paco managed to call Elena while the medical staff were distracted. He instructed her to destroy the talisman, the baby toy, in the old lady's hand. Elena did as instructed, picking up the toy, but she was cornered by the monster, who just showed up to flex its monstrous muscles in front of such a charming lady. Luckily, she managed to tear the toy to shreds, and it worked. The creature seemed disoriented and fled, disappearing down a manhole. Padre explained that he had placed the old lady in the sacred chamber. She was not dead, only unconscious. The bullets he had fired were blanks. He had done this to make the old lady believe that the bullets could subdue her, a way to deal with the logic of demons. He suggested that if reason fails, then play along with the enemy's logic. When Elena asked about the logic behind the pig-faced, multi-legged creature, Padre had no explanation. The next day, the old lady's murder made the headlines, but there was no mention of the cowboy or the eight-legged creature. Paco suggested they might have been dreaming or under the influence of hallucinogens. Elena shot back, saying that sounds like wishful thinking. One day, a knight in the town sought out Elena, hoping she could check on the condition of his Ferrari horse. The knight owned a castle on the outskirts of town, and he planned to sell it to travel the world. He even invited Elena to be his personal horse doctor and accompany him to various competitions. The competitions were secondary. His main aim was to spend some hormone time alone with Elena. The two even met for a drink at a local bar. Paco also showed up, causing the knight to leave upon spotting him. It turned out that the knight had been Paco's competitor during the mayoral elections, and there had been some tension between them. The deeper reason, however, was that both men harbored feelings for Elena. The bar owner's son packed a bag and snuck out to have some fun, even stealing a few bottles of alcohol. They ended up at the cemetery in the middle of the night, playing a game to summon spirits. They summoned a ghost named Giacomo, the boy with a silver coin in his arm who was exorcised by Padre before. Giacomo played a hide-and-seek with them, and suddenly all the candles were extinguished, plunging the surroundings into darkness. Everyone quickly took out their phones for light, only to find that one companion named Soleil had disappeared. The area was open wilderness for half a mile with nowhere to hide. From the extinguishing of the candles to the lighting of the phone, only a few seconds had passed. Where could she have gone? After the incident, the town organized a large-scale search, but after several days, there was still no news. The bar owner was furious at his son, berating him for stealing alcohol and spreading rumors since he couldn't believe a person just disappeared into thin air. Soleil's father was the knight's guardsman. The knight introduced him as a pitiable man who had been with him for 20 years. Soleil's mother had been a chef working in the knight's castle, but she had been diagnosed with cancer a few months ago. Perhaps due to the immense psychological pressure, she chose to end her life by jumping off the castle walls. Worse yet, Soleil had witnessed her mother's death. Now, with Soleil's mysterious disappearance, one can only imagine the mental stress her father was under. Elena and Padre found Soleil's father, who recounted what he knew. At that time, the kids had played a summoning game and summoned an Italian ghost named Giacomo, who loved to play hide-and-seek. Elena, upon hearing the name, wondered whether it was real or fake. How could the ghost of the boy who was exercised in Italy by Padre have ended up here? She suspected that Giacomo might have followed Father Padre here. So Elena found another girl, Elvira, who had been part of the summoning game, and confirmed the story from her. Meanwhile, Mayor Paco, along with his wife, was holding a grand opening ceremony for their hotel. Soleil's father stormed in with a gun, demanding to find his daughter. Obviously, he was suffering an enormous mental pressure. 
That night, the young people who had played the summoning game discussed the strange event in a group chat. Suddenly, Soleil sent a message of garbled text. Everyone quickly asked her where she was and what had happened. Soleil then sent a string of crying emojis. At that moment, Elvira received a call from Soleil. A panicked voice came through, asking the group to play the summoning game again since only that could save her. Elena put the silver coin under a rock and began researching it online. Suddenly, with a loud crash, someone landed on the window. It was the girl Elvira. She then brought Elena to an abandoned house where the young people were preparing to play the summoning game again to save Soleil. Before they could start, the glass cup began to move on its own. It seemed to be quite impatient. Everyone put their fingers on the cup. The spirit they were communicating with was Soleil. She said they want to talk to Elena. Elena then reached to the other side of the cup and asked to return the silver coin. In a trance, she saw several priests dressed in red controlling the glass cup, scaring Elena into stepping back. At the same time, the candlelight went out again. A few seconds later, the candle relit and Soleil had really returned. Upon her return, Soleil began observing people around her. Once, she told an old man that he was going to die tonight. The old man clutched his chest after hearing this, whether from fear or something else. He indeed died that night. Mayor Paco was left speechless at the two deaths in just two months. It seemed like a turbulent year was ahead. Soleil told her good friend Elvira about her disappearance, describing it as a dreamlike state, but it felt very real. Even stranger was that people seemed different since her return. They were surrounded by colored halos. For instance, Elvira was surrounded by blue. Blue didn't mean much, but the elderly man who died had been surrounded by red, a red that was turning black, a sign of impending death. She then took Elvira to the balcony and pointed to a man below holding flowers, indicating that he was surrounded by black. Elvira was terrified and immediately told Elena about this. Elena tried to rationalize it, still believing that this was impossible. Suddenly, the man holding flowers was hit by a car and died. Elvira was frightened, thinking that it sounded more like a curse, but Elena kept dismissing it as an accident. Elena believed everything was related to the silver coin and asked Mayor Paco to do something about it. Paco also wanted to act, but his wife Merce was constantly nagging him, insisting that he must stay out of it to avoid responsibility and protect his reputation. Clearly, Merce was more concerned about power and prestige. Elena decided to seek help from Father Padre. They arrived at Soleil's house and finding no response, they broke in. They found Soleil attempting to hang herself. After rescuing her, Soleil told Padre that he was turning red and it's about to turn black. After hypnotizing Soleil, Padre rushed back to the church to practice boxing to flex his bald head and muscles, expecting a tough battle ahead. That night, the TV suddenly turned on by itself and couldn't be turned off. Various clips came together to form a message. Return the silver coin before dawn, or they will destroy this town and the ones he loves. Soleil showed up. While Padre was getting water, she took a knife from the table. When Padre returned, she handed him a small cloth. Opening it, he found a bloody severed finger. It was Soleil's own finger. She threatened that if the curse wasn't lifted, she would cut off her ears and tongue. Clearly, she was possessed by something evil. Padre ignored her and went out to call the police, but Soleil said when the police arrived, she would say he did all this and she slit her own mouth with the knife. Padre quickly convinced her to stop harming herself and promised to help her find the silver coin. He then took her to Elena's house, but despite searching everywhere, they couldn't find it. At the same time, Elena was escorted home by the night. Before they reached, they saw lights on in the house. The two hurried upstairs, discovering Padre and Soleil there. The knight questioned Padre about what he had done to Soleil. Suddenly, Soleil pulled out a knife and stabbed the knight, causing him to scream like a chicken. Soleil, still demanding the silver coin, insisted that it was the only way she could stop hearing the demons speak. By accident, the knight knocked a floor lamp against the wall, revealing the shadows of several men resembling priests. It seemed someone was indeed influencing Soleil. Elena then secretly retrieved the silver coin hidden beneath a stone. Padre held Soleil tightly, urging her to control her thoughts and not be manipulated by those things, reminding her that the mind molds the body. But Soleil, seemingly fully possessed by now, blew the roof off the house. Everyone grabbed hold of whatever they could. Unluckily, the knight lost his grip and was sent flying up into the sky. Padre urged Soleil to control herself and think of her mother. At these words, Soleil stabilized, her powers subsided, and the roof repaired itself.
Outside, Elena found the unconscious knight and took him and Soleil to the hospital. It turned out that those demons who were threatening Soleil had exploited her love for her mother, fooling her into believing that if she found the silver coin, her mother could be resurrected. This led to Soleil's delusion and eventual possession. In the hospital, a familiar face was speaking to thin air. It was the previous beggar who had jumped off the building. He wasn't dead after all. The air shimmered, and a figure resembling a priest appeared. The beggar was indeed speaking to someone, saying that he would take care of Father Padre and let the Cardinal not to worry. He even finished with a cryptic phrase, the moment of Judas. Given the clues, it should be clear that a certain force is collecting all these 30 scattered silver coins for unknown reasons. In New York, another old man wearing a necklace arrived at a silver jewelry exchange. He detached a silver coin from his necklace, which left the salesperson baffled. The old man said nothing, just lightly grazed the salesperson's neck with his nail, causing a gash to appear. The old man retrieved his coin, hailed a taxi, and left. In the little town, where a wedding ceremony is taking place at the town hall, Mayor Paco, serving as the officiant, is rambling on and on, clearly distracted. His wife Merce comments on his ashen face. Paco knows she's up to something. Once the wedding is certified, she wants the ceremony to be held in their new hotel, so as to make personal gains using public position. Merce encourages Paco to think about the future. Once they have enough money, he won't need to be a mayor anymore. At the moment, the wedding cake hasn't arrived yet. Meanwhile, a driver is transporting the wedding cake. He seems a bit tipsy. His wife keeps asking why they haven't arrived yet. It turns out the driver was unable to sleep all night due to some issue, and he kept mumbling something about a mirror. Distracted, he crashed into a tree. Luckily, he wasn't hurt. Paco rushed to the hospital to visit the driver. The driver's wife explained the cause of the incident. They run a pharmacy and had recently bought an old house that hadn't been lived in for 50 years. During the renovation, they encountered something inexplicable. The driver's wife couldn't explain it, so she called Paco over. The problem was with a large mirror. Paco looked at it and saw nothing wrong. She told him to look closely. After a while, Elena received a call from Paco asking her to rush to the pharmacy. It seems he had discovered something incredible. As Elena prepared to leave, her dog went crazy. She pulled out the silver coin from her bag and yelled at it. Elena locked the dog in a cage, then put the silver coin in a small box and hurried to the pharmacy. She stood in front of the mirror for a while. It seemed like a very normal mirror. Paco told her to look at a book in the mirror and then back at the table. Elena was shocked to find a book only existed in the mirror. Apparently, the mirror was haunted and the driver had crashed due to its influence. Elena used a magnifying glass to look at the book title, which was in Greek. She searched online and found it was called the Gospel of Judas. Originally, the Gospels meant letters or books that record the life and deeds of Jesus. But the Gospel of Judas was considered a false gospel by the church, meaning the events described are fake. It's called a false gospel because in the Gospels of Matthew, Judas is considered a traitor. But in the Gospel of Judas, this view is completely overturned. In the Gospel of Judas, Judas is actually Jesus' most trusted, most faithful disciple, and he betrayed Jesus because Jesus asked him to. It means that Jesus asked Judas to deliberately betray him in order to fulfill God's redemption plan and to resurrect himself. Jesus did indeed resurrect later. Could it be that Judas' act of betrayal was actually helping Jesus become a god? Paco found Father Padre, who confirmed the Gospel of Judas. He said it's normal for some heretics to still be keen on the Gospel of Judas because it has a basic logic. But there's one problem. If the Gospel of Judas is true, then Judas is a deceiver. Would God allow such a sinful act? And how do we distinguish between good and evil? Like Judas, who did evil things, but in God's plan, he was playing the role of good. So the heretic's claim is that doing evil is doing good. Paco took Padre to the haunted mirror. Only a few pages of the Gospel of Judas have survived in reality, but there was a thick book reflected in the mirror. As the three of them were studying it, they discovered a door in the mirror was always open while its real-life counterpart was closed. Padre flicked the switch a few times, but the door in the mirror remained open, leading to their confusion. Suddenly, Elena saw a shadowy figure enter the room in the mirror. The three of them rushed to check but found nothing. There was yet another door in the room that wouldn't open. Padre decided to stay and investigate on his own, and Paco left with Elena. He spent the afternoon secretly installing four surveillance cameras in the room, planning to watch what Father Padre was up to. He gave Elena the account details, telling her she could watch via an app. Elena refused outright, believing that this was invading someone's privacy. Afterward, Padre spent several hours there, but nothing happened. 
Once Elena got home, curiosity got the better of her and she downloaded the app. Suddenly, a clattering noise came from within the room. Padre looked over and saw it was a rat. The app even had a chat feature. Paco, hidden under his blanket, chatted happily with Elena and laughed hard. Merche asked if he was secretly watching something naughty. Paco then went to sleep. Around 5 a.m., Padre in the mirror suddenly rose, staring intently at the real-life Padre. At the same time, the dogs at the vet's office wouldn't stop barking. It seemed like something big was about to happen. The next day, when the two returned to the room, Father Padre was asleep like a pig on the table, as if nothing had happened. But Paco pointed out that something had happened. Padre was startled by his spying on him, but still felt lucky that he was not caught entertaining himself at night. Paco explained that they saw Padre in the mirror get up and walk into the room. There was a man slumped in a chair inside. It was none other than Giacomo, whom Padre had exercised. Now it seemed that the mirror could reflect people's dark side. Elena found the driver's wife and asked if there had been any other strange experiences. Shockingly, she revealed that the book in the mirror could even be touched. So if there was a problem, it was with the reality world. Some things were being hidden from this world. When they came out, they met the beggar who was still healing. The beggar warned Father Padre to be careful as the Romans were planning to make their move. Paco and Elena were downstairs when they noticed that the curtains had been drawn in the house. They rushed upstairs and saw Padre preparing to smash the haunted mirror with a hammer. They quickly stopped him. Just as Padre was about to swing the hammer, his mirror counterpart appeared and asked for a private talk. Paco and Elena left the room, confident that the surveillance cameras would catch everything. However, Padre dismantled all the cameras. Seeing this trouble, the two rushed upstairs, but found the door locked. The mirrors Padre pushed Giacomo from the inner room towards them. Seeing Giacomo, Padre was filled with pain and begged for Giacomo's forgiveness. Suddenly, Giacomo stood up to roar like a goose and pulled Padre into the mirror world. In exchange, the mirror Padre came out to the reality world. At that moment, Paco broke down the door, but the mirror returned to its original state. The two didn't notice anything unusual. Mirror Padre said they wanted the silver coin. He led them to the church and continued to tell the story of the heretics. He explained that since the heretics believed that to do evil is to do good, they actually did many bad things. He then showed Paco and Elena two relics. The first was the blood of Ambrose. The second was a sponge, the one a soldier had used to give vinegar to Jesus on the cross. He then explained that these seemingly insignificant things are all endowed with infinite power by God. Similarly, the heretics also have their own opposite relics. Their relics are all things that destroyed Jesus, such as the nails of the cross, the crown of thorns, and the spear of Longinus, etc. These are the sources of the heretics' power. Among them, the most powerful one is Judas's 30 silver coins, which led to the betrayal and arrest of Jesus. Mira Padre wanted to retrieve the silver coin from Elena, pretending to protect it but actually helping the heretics collect the coins. Elena noticed that this Padre's tone was different, more aggressive. Moreover, the silver coin was not on her. They had to go back and retrieve it from the box. So Mira Padre followed them there. Noticing that Padre was scared before, but now was acting confident, Elena wondered if he was influenced by the mirror. But Mira Padre just brushed it off, saying that he just wanted to protect the things that Giacomo left behind. In the end, Elena chose to believe him and prepared to hand over the silver coin she had retrieved. Just then, she noticed his watch. The numbers on the dial were reversed. Realizing that he was not Padre at all, she pushed him away and hid with Paco in the vet clinic. Paco quickly called the police. Meanwhile, the dogs in the vet's office broke out of their cages and barked at them. Mira Padre told the police not to go to the vet's office because there's nothing there, and instead invited the police to come to the church with him. And so he headed towards the church, inviting anyone he met along the way to join him. It seemed like people were all under a spell, obediently following him. Thus a crowd surged towards the church in the middle of the night. In the veterinary clinic, Elena knocked out a mad dog with a dose of anesthetic. Since the fake Padre was here, the real one should be in the mirror. So they went back to the mirror to check. Elena, guided by the reflection, was able to feel a gospel on the table. She picked it up and threw it at the mirror. Surprisingly, the world behind the mirror was real. Later, they both entered an inner room in the mirror world. Meanwhile, Mirror Padre was bewitching the townsfolk, turning them against Paco and Elena. The townsfolk rose in revolt, ready to confront Paco and Elena. In the mirror world, the two entered a grand hall. Mirrors lined both sides of the hall. Through the mirrors, they could see different places in the world. In a mirror at the far end, many red-robed bishops were in a meeting. 
The figure with a sack over its head in the front should be Padre. Sitting opposite was a bishop wearing glasses, seemingly the leader. They were preparing to execute Padre in public. At the same time, a crowd of people filled with righteous fury rushed towards the veterinary clinic. Unwilling to watch Father Padre get killed, Elena slapped the silver coin onto the mirror. Padre took the opportunity to run towards the mirror, only to find that behind the shattered mirror was just a wall. It seemed that the mirror had been endowed with some energy to form a sort of passageway. The townsfolk stormed the clinic like zombies, destroying and looting everything in sight. Paco carried the real Padre out, causing Mirror Padre to vanish into thin air and the mirror to turn back into a wall. After that, the townsfolk seemed to snap back to reality, unaware of what had transpired. They had been ensnared by dark magic, but Elena scolded them for destroying her clinic and exclaimed that the silver coin was the root cause of all the trouble. So, Elena went to the bridge and threw the coin into the river. Elsewhere, a bunch of people, disguised as workers but actually heretics, were moving through a subway tunnel. They discovered a relic, a gigantic cross with Lorin written on it, distinguished from a regular cross by its double crossbeam, also known as the True Cross. The same man in sunglasses as shown at the beginning of the film obtained another silver coin from the relic. The scene then shifts back to the small town, where Elena's veterinary clinic had been trashed by the townsfolk under the spell of the fake Padre. Elena's life was in shambles. Paco didn't explain much, believing it was better that the townsfolk remained unaware of many things. He only mentioned that there had been an accidental fire at Elena's clinic and proposed that everyone should donate some money to help her get back on her feet. Everyone agreed. At this moment, Trini's father spoke up. Trini was the girl who had hidden her pregnancy with a cloth wrapped around her stomach. The father pointed out that strange things had been happening. A cow giving birth to a boy, the cowboy then disappearing, people dying. He suggested that one person in the town was highly suspicious, its father Padre. Merce added fuel to the fire, saying that strange things only started to happen after Padre, who had spent time in prison, came to the town. The townsfolk began to argue, demanding a collective letter be written to the bishop to replace the priest. In the end, Paco and his wife had a big argument due to their different opinions. Unaware of the situation, Padre knew that his presence was putting the townsfolk in danger. Thus, he packed a bag, bought a plane ticket, and quietly left. On the plane, he was remembering some past events from 1990 in Rome. He and his other two friends, Sandro and Fabio, were all priests. They would often sit down and discuss various things about God. Fabio had innovative thoughts, saying that he wanted to find God, but it seemed impossible because God was in an unreachable place, far beyond the gaze of mere mortals like them. But the devil was just a stone's throw away, so he wondered if they would draw God's attention by capturing the devil. Padre was shocked to hear that and said his thoughts were quite dangerous. Fabio then took out a fork and asked Sandro to stretch out his hand, and after a flurry of pricks, Sandro quickly withdrew his hand. Padre also dared not. Fabio teased them for being cowards, saying they too were afraid of a mere fork prick, let alone face the devil. But Padre asked Fabio if he was scared too. In response, Fabio stabbed the fork into his own hand. With these memories, Padre flew all the way to Rome. Back in the small town, the villagers began to donate money to Elena. At first, she accepted it, but she realized that everyone was looking at her with pity. She was filled with anger, thinking that they teamed up to smash her clinic and then came to sympathize with her in a fake manner. Some even threw money into her car. She had to throw it out of the window in frustration, treating it like a bunch of garbage. She found the knight later, wanting to travel around the world with him to get away from these vulgar people. Meanwhile, in Rome, Padre arrived at a temple that was under renovation. The temple used to be a theological seminary. Looking at the ruined remnants in front of him, Padre was reminded of his past. It was still 1990, and Padre, Sandro, and Fabio were studying here. In the classroom, the teacher was explaining exorcism, saying that prayer is the most useful weapon to ward off the devil's slander. Padre raised his hand and asked why they had to stop it. If the devil has possessed a human, it must want to tell us something. Can't we listen to what the devil wants to say first? However, the teacher dismissed his nonsense, saying that he probably didn't value his life if he even wanted to converse with the devil. When class ended, Padre waited outside for the other two, still sticking to his view that one can't defeat an enemy that they don't understand. That night, Fabio took them to a warehouse. He showed them a man who had been tied up there for two months and told them the man was the devil himself. Upon hearing this, Sandro took out holy water to exorcise him, but it was useless. 
The devil asked for a cigarette and revealed something only Padre knew, saying that when Padre was 12, he accidentally killed his family's dog with a stone and buried it in the backyard without telling his parents. His mother thought his father had secretly given the dog away, which led to a big fight. Also, the devil knew the name of the girl Padre often fantasized about when he was young. Hearing this, Padre believed that the man was indeed the devil because he had never mentioned these things to anyone. But Sandro didn't believe it and demanded proof. The devil then blew out a ball of fire that burned Sandro. The devil revealed that after the Holy War, Satan and his minions retreated to a safe, invisible place within God. In other words, a part of God harbored evil power. God knew this, but he didn't want to admit that evil was a part of him. So Fabio concluded that God was Satan himself. Fabio hoped to personally meet Satan, the head of the devils. The devil said that he just needed to walk through that door. Fabio obeyed and tried to pull Padre with him, but Padre refused him, so Fabio went in alone. When Padre opened the door, there was nothing inside, and the devil had disappeared. Back to the present, Padre arrived at the underground club to find Sandro and shared his encounter with Fabio. It turned out that the bishop with glasses who tried to kill Padre in the strange mirror incident last time was Fabio. Sandro said that Fabio was now elected as the chairman of the Interfaith Dialogue Committee. What he exactly did wasn't clear, but it sounded quite impressive and it was a legitimate position. Sandro advised Padre to go somewhere painful, such as the club where Sandro was beaten every day. The pain emitted would prevent Fabio from finding Sandro. But in order to hide from Fabio, Padre needed to go somewhere even more painful. Naturally, it was a place with war, so Padre decided to head to Syria. Back at the town, Mayor Paco found Elena, who was about to pack up and leave. Of course, Paco didn't want her to go, but seeing the knight come to pick her up, he thought he couldn't keep her. Even though he was filled with jealousy, he had no choice but to watch Elena leave. He blamed his wife Merche for Elena and the priest's departure, so he vented his anger on her. Merche cried as she drove home and met the beggar in a wheelchair. The beggar mentioned an old lady in town who he insisted was a devil. Merche comforted him and took him back to the hospital. It's revealed that ever since Fabio stepped through the gates of hell, Padre and Sandro, who was injured, had to rely on each other. But Padre had encountered Fabio once in between. It was when they were recuperating in Jerusalem. Padre saw Fabio, but when he caught up, Fabio insisted that Padre had mistaken him for someone else. Padre then saw Fabio get into a car with the sunglass man, who was actually an assassin sent by the heretics. Back to the present, Padre found a priest named Lombardi. Lombardi asked why he left the town without notice. There were terrible things happening there, which was why the church sent him to the town. Lombardi was probably Padre's superior and felt that something was about to happen in the town again. The scene switches to the town, where an old lady came to a scarecrow and took out a battered wallet from its body. Inside was a photo of Elena and her husband. This old lady was the devil the beggar spoke of. She then performed a dark magic on the scarecrow. On Padre's side, he mentioned the matter of the 30 silver coins. Lombardi listened and realized why Padre wanted to escape the town. Fabio wouldn't let him go. Padre wondered, since Fabio wanted the silver coins so much, why didn't Fabio just kill him? Could there be another plan? Anyway, only one person could save Padre now, and that was the Holy Father. After saying goodbye to Lombardi, Padre saw the devil from the warehouse, but the devil disappeared soon. He followed Padre, but for what purpose remained unknown. Suddenly, Padre woke up, realizing it was a dream, but it felt so real. On the following day, Padre packed his belongings to find the Holy Father mentioned by Lombardi. In the town, the old lady finished her magic and the scarecrow came back to life. It had turned into a real person. He returned home and washed off the mud on his body. Meanwhile, Elena and the knight were preparing to board a plane when Paco and the officer hurriedly arrived. They told her that her husband has returned. The scarecrow turned out to be Elena's husband, who had been missing for two years, so she needed to rush home immediately. After a long search, Padre found the Holy Father and relayed everything that had happened. The Holy Father instructed him to report to the Cardinal first. As the words left his mouth, Fabio appeared in red vestments. Could it be that the church had already been infiltrated? As previously mentioned, Padre once accidentally killed his family's dog. As soon as he buried the dog in the backyard, his father returned. The loss of the dog caused a huge fight between his parents. 
Padre and Fabio were childhood friends, and they would often trade cards as their hobby. Padre shared to him the story about accidentally killing the dog and causing his parents to fight. He's conflicted about whether or not to tell his mother the truth. Upon hearing this, Fabio gave all his cards to Padre to console him. Suddenly, Fabio asked where Padre hid the silver coin. Without thinking, Padre blurted out the coin was with Elena. However, Padre suddenly realized something was wrong. He was only eight years old at the time and couldn't possibly know Elena. When he asked what was going on, it turned out that Fabio had used an illusion to trick him into revealing the location of the silver coin. Padre panicked. In the town, Paco took Elena to the police station. Elena recognized the man before her. It was indeed her husband. She hadn't expected to rekindle their love after being separated by death. But Paco wasn't too pleased by their reunion. Padre was now in danger. Every time he fell asleep, he would enter the illusion. In one of the illusions, even Sandro appeared, saying that he shouldn't have come back. Before Padre realized it was a dream, Fabio appeared and demanded the silver coin. Sandro then led Padre into a concrete pipe, telling him they were both dreaming and to wake up quickly and wait for him to come find him. After giving Sandro a card, Padre ran away. Sandro woke up in a club and bought a postcard at a stall. The pattern on it was identical to the card Padre had given him in the dream. It indicated the location of the castle where Padre currently was. Sandro wanted to go in, but he was stopped by security. He was told that he could buy a ticket to see the exhibition, but he was not allowed to enter the castle. At this time, the assassin also rushed here with a suitcase. Taking advantage of the security guard's distraction, Sandro sneaked in. Back in the town, the townsfolk were gossiping about Elena. Now, her relationship with three men were complicated. Paco overheard and stormed off in anger. The scene then shifted to Elena and her husband rekindling an old flame. But in fact, Elena's husband was transformed from the scarecrow, and his actions and speech were remotely controlled by the old lady. Meanwhile, Trini's father returned home. Hearing about Elena's husband's return, he was so frightened that he sat down hard on a stool. Sandro happened to see an exhibit, the Spear of Longinus, the spear that pierced Jesus on the cross. It was once owned by Hitler. Just then, Sandro noticed the assassin enter a room, so he tricked the guard into a corner, knocked him out, and slipped in himself. Trini's father decided to see for himself. Upon seeing Elena's husband, he was so scared that he kept retreating, insisting that he was not human. That night, he even picked up a hunting rifle, intending to kill Elena's husband. He entered the house and started shooting everywhere. Fortunately, the officer showed up and shot him in the arm, stopping him. At that moment, Paco also arrived. Trini's father confessed the truth that he had already killed Elena's husband before, who was dead as a doornail. So whatever was standing before him could not possibly be human. At this time, Elena and her husband were preparing to drive off to a faraway place, leaving this land of trouble. As they were talking, the husband suddenly told her that she should have given it to them. Elena was stunned, not knowing what he was talking about. Her husband suddenly became violent, slapped her, and demanded to know where the silver coin was hidden. Carelessly, he drove the car into a ditch. Over on Sandro's side, he discovered the location of Padre. He saw several people changing Padre's clothes and taking him to a hall. Fabio went up to the stage and spoke. It turned out that they had already collected 29 silver coins and were only missing the last one. Once this last coin was collected, the world would change. As soon as he said so, there was a round of applause from below. Fabio added that the last coin had always been guarded by Padre. To protect the last silver coin, Padre did not hesitate to leave his hometown and was even imprisoned. In reality, Fabio was trying to give him an invitation to join them. Hearing this, Sandro confidently walked in. He raised his hand and clapped a few times before he was captured. Afterward, Fabio took Padre to the Vatican Archive. Fabio showed Padre the Book of Miracles of the Three Wise Men from the East. It's rumored that when Jesus was born, three wise men from the ancient Persian kingdom saw a large star in the sky in the direction of Bethlehem. So the heretics followed it to Jesus' birthplace and brought many gifts. These books of miracles were one of those gifts, and they were magical books teaching how to cast spells. This could explain why the heretics could use so many dark magics. They had learned it from these books. At the same time, the heretics were also deciphering Jesus' own gospel. Padre was shocked, believing that it was not possible because Jesus doesn't have his own gospel. He asked him why not bring it to light if he had it. Fabio said if he read the gospel himself, he would also want to keep it hidden. It seems that there's something remarkable written in Jesus' gospel. Fabio told Padre he could freely view these items, but on one condition, he had to join them. Surprisingly, Padre agreed. Later, the two found Sandro. 
With a light wave of his hand, Fabio sent Sandro flying like a fat bird. He then took out a knife and told Padre to finish him off and then follow him, but Padre suddenly turned against him and chose to stay with Sandro. So the two of them took off running. Seeing that he couldn't keep up, Fabio performed a resurrection spell on a corpse on the ground, causing it to transform. After a moment, a strange, horrifying creature emerged from the broken body and gave a fast and furious chase to the two, who struggled to run for their lives. On Elena's side, her husband, seeing Elena faint, carried her out. He first hijacked a car at a gas station, filled it with petrol, and then drove off. Paco arrived at the location described by Trini's father. He started digging with a shovel, and before long he really unearthed a skeleton, which was said to be Elena's husband's. It seemed that Trini's father wasn't lying. Just then, Elena sent a distress text message, asking for help because something was off with her husband. Her husband took Elena to a bridge and demanded to know where she threw the silver coin. She pointed down and told him it's down there, asking him to go and fetch it himself. But the husband replied that it would come back on its own. He then prepared to jump off the bridge with Elena. Fortunately, Paco and the officer arrived in time to rescue Elena. On Padre's side, the two of them fought with the horrifying creature from inside to outside. The creature used its tentacles to bind Sandro and turned him into a bloody pulp in minutes. Just when it was about to kill Padre, Fabio stopped the creature and made it spare his life because the heretics would still need him. Padre picked up the spear of Longinus from the ground and killed the creature. Then he ran off. The group found a secluded spot in the cemetery and buried Elena's husband. Elena told Paco that she didn't even think twice before texting him for help. Paco then asked if the knight was there too, who she would have texted. There was no answer, but Elena leaned in and their lips met without using their juicy tongues. Just then, a timely phone call from the knight came in to disrupt their smelly moment. It turns out Elena had decided to go to Paris to find the knight. Given the fact that her husband came back to life and died again, there was no way she could stay in the small town. She simply couldn't explain it. At this time, the knight was in a high-end restaurant in Paris. He and his friend ordered a fish. When the chef was dissecting the fish, he found the silver coin in the fish's stomach. It seems the silver coin really could return on its own. Father Padre woke up in a dilapidated building. Suddenly, he received a call from Elena, who asked where he had been these days. Padre said the heretics now knew that the silver coin was with her, and he told her to run for her life. The heretics would stop at nothing to get the silver coin back. Elena asked him where he was and she would go find him. They should team up to be stronger. Otherwise, their fate would be the same as Sandro's. Padre was shocked and asked how she knew Sandro. It turned out that the person on the other end of the phone was Fabio. He had cast some kind of voice-changing spell, trying to get Padre to reveal his hiding place. Padre knew there was something fishy about the call and quickly smashed the phone. In order to avoid Fabio's hunting, he took Sandro's advice and fled all the way to a place in Syria, which was filled with a sense of suffering. In the small town, today was Mayor Paco's campaign day for his re-election. His wife, Merce, started to get busy early in the morning. However, Paco was noticeably filled with negativity. He pulled Merce aside and said he didn't want to be mayor anymore. Merce glared at him and ordered him to give a good speech for his wife. Paco then got on stage and read a few lines from his script before finally breaking down. He announced he quit after this term. At that moment, a car pulled up and two agents got out. They worked for the National Security Department and had come to investigate the strange events that had recently occurred in the town. Over the past five years, the officer had issued three reports, but in the past six months alone, he had written 25. So he requested support from headquarters. The two agents arrived as reinforcements. They were very assertive and took control of everything right away. On the same day, they arrived at Trini's house to investigate her father's case of walking around town with a gun and the fact that he had killed Elena's husband. The mayor and others had likely suppressed the latter incident. After all, it was unexplainable how Elena's husband had resurrected and then disappeared. Trini's child had also grown significantly, indicating that some time had passed. Trini's father had been on house arrest awaiting trial. The officer warned Trini's father not to say anything out of line and explained that he was just drunk that night. The man nodded in agreement. But when the two agents rushed over, he ended his life by shooting himself. Padre witnessed the horrors of war in Syria, the cheapness of human life, the readily spilled blood, the indelible smoke of gunpowder. One day, Father Lombardi came to him and shared that things were difficult. 
they couldn't contact the Holy Father, and the real person in control of the Roman Curia was clearly Fabio. The Pope had been assassinated and might have been orchestrated by Fabio. Although the Pope was seriously injured, he was not dead. Padre speculated that it might be the sacred objects in the church that were protecting him. Fabio wouldn't dare to be too presumptuous with the sacred objects around. However, if he managed to gather 30 silver coins, things would be different. This was why the heretics tried to collect all these 30 coins. He could then control everything and turn the Curia into a place for the heretics. The best course of action now would be to meet up with Elena to protect the last silver coin. Lombardi suggested that Padre also use dreams to contact Elena. Padre was stunned, saying that he hadn't read the Book of Miracles and didn't know how. Padre then knocked himself out with an anesthetic and returned to the small town in his dream. He searched for Elena everywhere and finally found a confused Elena in the supermarket. He asked her if she was real, so Elena mentioned something only Padre would know. After confirming she was real, he told her that they were in a dream and she needed to protect the silver coin until he found her. Elena said she had thrown it away long ago. At this moment, other people in the supermarket were eavesdropping on their conversation. Worrying that Fabio might have also invaded their dream, Padre tried to leave the place with Elena, but the supermarket had turned into a labyrinth. Suddenly, Soleil appeared and used her old trick, cutting her mouth with a knife. Elena was so frightened that she covered her eyes. When she looked again, everything was gone, including Soleil and Padre. She might have been scared awake. As people wake up in reality, their dream selves disappear. Ahead of her was a cardinal in red. It was Fabio. The red cloth on the ground slowly engulfed Elena. The next day, Padre was arrested by the local soldiers because he wore a cross necklace around his neck. Having religious beliefs could lead to factionalism, which could easily cause trouble in a war-torn area. The soldiers threw Padre into a pit. In the small town, everyone was immersed in the grief of Trini's father's death. At this time, two Japanese tourists came to visit, but the castle, a tourist attraction, was not open. They planned to return on Thursday and bring their families with them. After the tourists left, Paco and Merce had another big argument. They talked about everything from their current situation to their original intentions for getting married. Paco's initial desire was for a simple life. Little did he know that he would end up as a mayor with a vast business empire. Merce was the driving force behind all of this. Paco didn't want to continue being Merce's puppet. Merce believed their relationship had collapsed because Paco had fallen in love with Elena. Merce told Paco to go find Elena, wanting peace and quiet. This scene happened to be witnessed by the two agents. Paco went home, grabbed a suitcase without packing anything, and prepared to leave to find Elena. He made several phone calls, but no one answered. The scene switched to Paris. The assassin found an elderly man and asked him how he was doing. The old man replied that he was doing fine. The assassin gave him a necklace. Once the old man wore it, he became a puppet. Not far away in a restaurant, the knight was dining and chatting with Elena. After a few drinks, the knight told Elena about his recent fish-eating experience, where he found a silver coin in a fish's belly. He gave the coin to Elena as a gift. Elena was shocked when she saw the coin. It had returned. She excused herself to go to the restroom to calm down. Downstairs, the puppet old man was coming up the stairs. The last silver coin was about to fall into enemy hands. Elena quickly called Paco. At this time, Paco was being questioned by the two agents. Elena told him about the coin's return. Paco said he was coming to find her right away. But before he could finish, the puppet old man came up and shot the knight twice. Elena heard the gunshots and saw the old man looking for the coin. The coin had fallen to the ground. A security guard tried to stop the old man, and in the scuffle, he pulled off the necklace from the old man's neck, causing the old man to collapse. Elena noticed the silver coin was gone from the box. At some point, it had ended up under her foot. She wondered why the heretics didn't go after Padre instead. The officer saw that Paco hadn't returned and went to check, only to find out about the knight's tragic death. The town's widows whispered to Merce that all men were no good. They encouraged Merce to uplift herself, maybe with a splash of makeup, and surpass that lascivious woman, Elena. They were ready to help her. Upon hearing this, Merce was filled with an unspeakable sorrow. On Padre's side, he sat in a pit, constantly questioning God what he should do. Suddenly, a rope was thrown down. Padre climbed up with all his might, only to be kicked back down. The soldiers taunted him for their amusement. In the same town, the beggar on the brink of death sat up abruptly, crying out that he was coming. 
The agents rushed to inquire what was going on. The startled beggar blurted out that a new priest was coming. Seeing the beggar's innocent face, they decided to interrogate him. The beggar spilled everything. The cow giving birth to a child, the spider creature, the magic mirror, and the scarecrow coming back to life. The agents dismissed him as mentally ill and ignored him. They strolled to the city wall and indeed saw a man approaching. He claimed to be a new priest sent by the Bishop of Segovia, but it was clear that he was the devil from the storeroom, the same one that had burned Sandro. Merche planned to let the new priest stay in the house next to the church, but he refused, stating he wouldn't usurp Padre's place before his return. So Merche arranged for him to stay in the best room. They chatted and laughed, and it seemed that Merche saw the new priest as a balm for her soul. When the two agents left, they noticed a putrid black substance on the ground. Meanwhile, the new priest scooped up a similar black substance from a jar and swallowed it. He smacked his lips and sucked his fingers. Padre was still suffering in the pit, whiling away his time with spiders and rats. One day, a young man appeared before him, saying that he was his savior, and thanked him for removing the silver coin from his arm. It turned out this person was Giacomo, but it was unclear whether he was human or ghost. He urged Padre to have faith in God. As he opened his palm, two wounds were visible, bleeding incessantly. Suddenly, the cover of the pit opened and Giacomo disappeared. The soldiers blindfolded Padre and drove him into the desert. It didn't seem like they were releasing him. It was more like an execution. The knight's body was transported back to the small town for burial. In the graveyard, the two agents shockingly opened Elena's husband's tomb to analyze the skeletal remains inside. Apparently, two eyewitnesses had reported to them that the officer had secretly stashed away these bones. So the two agents forced the officer to perform an autopsy on the corpse. In a corner of the desert, Padre was released. The soldier who released him had always been kind to him, even secretly returning Padre's cross when the other soldiers beat him. After expressing his thanks, Padre and two other escapees got into a vehicle and left this contentious area. But a guard climbed into the car and started fighting with Padre, eventually causing the car to flip over. Both men got up and continued to fight. In the end, Padre dispatched the guard with a knife. Looking at the shape of the wound, Padre realized it was identical to the one Giacomo had shown him, understanding that it was all God's guidance. Back in town, the beggar was secretly following the new priest. The new priest gave an old woman a packet of medicine, then left. The old woman poured the medicine powder into drainage channels. Merce gave the church keys to the new priest. Seeing that Merce's eyes were red from crying, he asked what was wrong and if she needed to confess. Merce then shared her obsession with fame and profit and even her exploitation of Paco. She also mentioned that her husband might have fallen in love with another woman but didn't say who. He asked if Elena was now with Paco. This slip of the tongue revealed his knowledge. Merce asked if she had mentioned Elena's name and how he would know. The new priest didn't panic, saying she had told him. He then gave Merce a card, telling her to secretly place it on Paco. Perhaps it could help her solve her troubles. On the other hand, the mysterious corpse's autopsy report had come out. The officer was surprised at how fast it was. The report stated that a shotgun had hit the body's head. They demanded an explanation from the officer, but he slammed the table in anger, saying the man was dead, then came back to life and finally turned into dust. With that, he quit, leaving the two to continue the investigation. The result of the investigation showed that the small town was cursed. The old woman came to the slaughterhouse, killed a security guard with a meat hook, then left pushing a cart full of pig heads. By this time, white smoke was billowing out of the town's sewer. Merce went to the hotel where her husband was staying. While he was out, she placed the card the new priest had given her into his coat pocket. When she came out, she noticed the smoke from the sewer was even thicker, and it smelled like excrement. Unable to bear it, Merce called Paco to do something as the town's mayor. Paco was also curious, asking if someone had thrown a smoke bomb. Back in his room, Paco left a voice message for Elena, saying that strange things were happening again. He was ready to tell the townspeople the truth and asked when she would be back. Then he put on his coat, ready to leave. The beggar was still trailing the new priest, noticing him sprinkling a viscous black liquid around the small town. He willingly approached and asked him what he was doing and offered to help him. The new priest glanced at him and thought, this town not only had widows, but also fools. Since someone was willing to help, he handed the boy a container, instructing him to surround the town with the substance. So the beggar began to do his job. At the bar, Paco gathered the townsfolk, ready to reveal the truth. But just as he was about to disclose the key point, the new priest walked in. 
He took over, beguiling the townsfolk. After finishing his task, the beggar walked in and accused the new priest of being the devil himself, claiming the thick fog was his doing to prevent them from seeing the line he had drawn on the ground. Afterward, he sat down and began to drink. The two agents noticed a pig's head nailed to a door, eerily reminiscent of witchcraft. A girl, playing ball outside in the fog, discovered an invisible barrier at the main gate. Her ball couldn't pass through it. It seemed the new priest had trapped the townsfolk from leaving. The black line on the ground served this purpose. Paco, feverish and unwell, was cared for by Merche. It seemed like he had been bewitched due to the magic card given by the new priest. The next day, Elena returned to the small town with the last silver coin. The confused townsfolk gathered in the church. Elena reached the entrance and put her hand above the thick fog, causing the heretics to feel the return of the silver coin. Elena could walk in. It seemed the barrier only prevented exit. Upon entering, she saw an old woman pretending to have twisted her ankle on the ground. She helped her up and asked what was happening. Meanwhile, the officer snuck out, stole a car and tried to escape the town, but the barrier wouldn't even let bullets through. When Elena helped the old woman reach the hotel, the old woman refused to move further, telling Elena to go in herself and someone was waiting for her. Elena went upstairs to find Paco on the verge of death. From a high point, the townsfolk saw the dense fog only within the town area, nowhere else, and someone in a car was heading their way. It was none other than Padre, who walked in without hesitation. In the church, Merche found the new priest and complained that everyone was going crazy. They were afraid to go out and what they should do. The new priest replied that out of the vast world, only this small town was chosen. Something big is about to happen here, and only the best can witness it. He told her to leave through the window in the sacristy. After that, he convinced the townsfolk to stay calm and stay here, before leaving and locking the door behind him. The townsfolk were stunned, wondering what the bastard was up to. Merche escaped through the window of the sacristy. Meanwhile, the new priest threw a lit cigarette into the church, igniting a massive fire. Merche couldn't find the new priest anywhere, so she returned to the small hotel where Paco was staying. To her surprise, Elena was there. Seeing her enemy, she was filled with rage, and the two started fighting. Paco tried to intervene, but he only had enough strength to turn over. In the process, the magic card fell out of his pocket, and Merche also pulled off the silver coin from Elena's neck. Paco managed to push Merche aside. She told her husband go home together, and this was a test from God. Something wonderful was about to happen. Paco retorted her bullshit, saying that the new priest was hurting the people. He promised her he could go home with her, but she had to give him the silver coin. When Merche heard him ask for the silver coin, she decided it was over. After kicking Paco several times, she ran out and handed the silver coin obediently to the new priest. At this moment, the church doors were kicked open by the townsfolk. They swarmed out in a frenzy, colliding like headless flies. The church was instantly consumed by a massive fire. Into this chaos, a figure strode against the tide. It was Padre. He opened his arsenal, geared up, and stepped out into the blaze. The battle was about to erupt. Upon seeing Paco and Elena, Padre tossed them a bag, telling them to stand with him to protect God. After blustering for a while, a figure emerged from the thick fog, covered in white and inscribed with symbols. It was the new priest, the devil who served Fabio. He then summoned the dark force. As he spoke, a monstrous creature burrowed out from the ground, flexing its ugly figure in front of everyone. Padre was swiftly overwhelmed and knocked unconscious. Paco and Elena dragged him into the church. The monster vanished as quickly as it had appeared. The devil couldn't find anyone in the church and was forced to give up for the time being. He retracted the town's fog and the townsfolk resumed their daily lives, albeit with a distinct difference. They seemed to be bewitched by the devil. A week later, a group of Japanese tourists arrived, planning to visit the castle. As soon as they entered the town, the townsfolk surrounded them like zombies. Paco, observing this scene from an upper floor, went to report to Elena and Padre. It turns out the trio had been hiding in the cellar for 15 days. Paco had even caught a pigeon on his recent outing. Paco claimed he saw his wife Merche. He had a hunch that she was not bewitched, but was pretending to blend in with the people for survival. Elena warned him not to fall for any traps. Meanwhile, Padre had identified the black line on the ground. It was a very ancient curse. The black liquid was made from the blood of unborn f Padre smashed a hole in a wall. He needed two things. Blood of Ambrosia, which was kept in the church and was a weapon against the devil, and a map of the entire cellar for easy in and out. Under the cover of night, Paco attempted to sneak into the church. 
Inside the church, the devil had the Japanese tourists brought in and force-fed them what he called the Holy Communion. Once ingested, they would become obedient puppets. Merce didn't take the communion with her mouth. She took it away with her hand. Paco easily obtained the blood of Ambrosia and didn't rush back. Instead, he and Elena went to find the map of the cellar. However, they were discovered. Paco knocked one person out, and Elena subdued another with a gun, forcing him to help find the map. When they returned, they gave the items to Padre. Padre smashed the blood of Ambrosia on the floor, smeared it around his eyes, and also dabbed some on the pigeon. He then released the pigeon through a skylight as if to scout from a bird's eye view. However, it was quickly spotted and brought down by a thrown stone. This was quite embarrassing. The townsfolk weren't all beguiled. The officer was a principled man who would rather die than join the enemy, yet he found himself strung up. In the evening, Paco discreetly left once again, witnessing several cars driving into the small town. The townsfolk were assisting in unloading various items. Upon returning home, Paco found his wife, who prepared a delicious meal for him. To his relief, Merce had not been beguiled and hadn't partaken in the Holy Communion. Simultaneously, Padre and Elena initiated their operation. Initially, the plan was for the three of them to act together, but in Paco's absence, Padre decided not to wait. Paco hoped that his wife would accompany him, but she rebuffed him with anger. After expressing her distaste for Elena's lecherous gaze, Merce attempted to show some affection, but Paco left abruptly. The beggar managed to secretly rescue the officer and even stole some food. They both enjoyed a hearty meal, during which the beggar mentioned that someone from Rome was coming to town, presumably Fabio. If he arrived, they would all be doomed. He also discussed the power of 30 silver coins. Napoleon had three, and Hitler had five. Hitler knew that the Jews had one, which led to the large-scale massacre, but he never found it. They imagined what would happen if Fabio had 30. The world could be destroyed in an instant. Meanwhile, Merce, with the food left over from Paco, found the old woman. After tasting a bit of the bread sauce that contained Paco's saliva as well as Elena's, the old woman concocted a strange potion with Merce's tears. Dipping a needle into the concoction, she attached it to Merce's clothing. The weapon was ready. The next move was up to her. In the cellar, Paco found Elena. A passionate massage ensued between them, much to Padre's chagrin. He suggested that the young couple could take a moment to kiss while he would scout ahead. Elena insisted on joining him, not willing to let him risk danger alone. However, Padre fell into a trap. Paco heard a noise and found someone from behind who looked like his wife. When he turned back, the person disappeared. Paco informed Elena about this incident, who was frustrated. She had told him to stay away from Merce. Suddenly, Merce appeared and began to fight with Elena. Merce pulled out the needle from her clothes and stabbed it into Elena's throat, rendering her unconscious. Paco immediately called Padre back, but Elena had disappeared. At this moment, another convoy of cars drove into the town. This time, it was a large force. The earlier group was likely delivering supplies. The townsfolk welcomed them as many bishops descended from the vehicles. Leading them was Fabio. The town was in a terrible state, with carcasses of livestock and bloodstains everywhere. Fabio embraced the devil, who told him that everything was ready for his coronation. Padre and Paco used the cellar to reach the hotel, the one that Paco and his wife used to run. Paco felt guilty, blaming himself for Elena's danger. After Padre consoled him, they resumed their mission and found Elena in one of the rooms. Two bishops passed by. Padre decided to follow them, and Paco prepared to join. However, someone stopped him, telling him not to go. When Paco saw the person, he drew his gun immediately. Turning back, he saw the old woman stroking Elena and claiming she could save her. All Paco had to do was to pull out the needle. Paco did as instructed, but Elena started bleeding profusely. Enraged, Paco berated the old woman and started to rough her up. Suddenly, the old woman revealed her true form. She had transformed into a terrifying spider-like monster. A fight ensued and they wrestled their muscles, but in the end, Paco won and the old woman met her end. Meanwhile, Fabio was bathing and changing clothes. The devil presented two treasures, a crown embedded with 29 silver coins and the Spear of Longinus, both relics used against Jesus. Padre approached, and the devil also came over. With a headbutt, the devil knocked Padre unconscious. After reviving, Padre used all his knowledge to fight against the devil, but to no avail. The devil then revealed a shocking secret. He was Giacomo, the young man Padre had exorcised and took the coin out of his skin. His transformation into Giacomo was for the purpose of handing over the silver coins, as he was chosen to be a saint, just like Judas was chosen by Jesus. Fabio embedded the last silver coin, bringing the total to 30. He then stabbed the Spear of Longinus into Padre's stomach, leaving him to his fate. 
Fabio donned his new attire, proclaimed himself as the new Pope of the Roman Church, and made his coronation announcement. On the other side, Paco was preparing to escape with Elena. They were detected by the two agents, but Paco took them down with two swift shots. As the bishop swarmed in, Paco floored the accelerator and fled with Elena. Meanwhile, the pigeon inside the beggar's clothes started to stir, so he let it fly. The pigeon's vision was still connected to Padre. He controlled the pigeon to attack Fabio, pulled the spear of Longinus out of his own body despite the pain, and ran towards Fabio. They both tumbled out of the window, landing hard on the ground, causing the coins to be scattered everywhere. Seeing this, the bishops rushed forward greedily. This was like finding a windfall. Merce also realized what was happening and discreetly stepped on one of the coins. However, the assassin noticed this. The two hesitated for a moment but decided to join forces, and so they left the scene hand in hand. Paco took Elena and dashed out of the town, showing that the barrier had disappeared. After the bishops divided the silver coins amongst themselves, they dispersed. The devil saw everything returning to the way it was before, so he decided to start anew. Changing his appearance, he walked into a mirror which transported him back to where Padre had entered the magic mirror passage. He chose America and walked into its streets, indicating that a ruckus would be caused in America in Season 2. The drama ends with Paco rushing Elena to the hospital to save her life. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.